Nikia Koto, welcome to this episode on urban regenerative agriculture. My name is Alina Siegfried. I'm the author of the Our Regenerative Future content series produced in partnership with Pure Advantage and the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. This is our 10th webinar this evening in this 12 part series, um, which followed on from a 15 part written content series that was published back in early May. And together we've been able to take a real deep dive into the world of regenerative agriculture over the past few months. It's been wonderful to see such momentum and energy around these conversations. Um, and now we've expanded the remit a little bit from purely regenerative agriculture into other uh, primary industries, including forestry, uh, horticulture and tourism as well, which is going to be next week's webinar. Um, this is partially in recognition that we all have a role to play in the regeneration of our environment, our social systems and our economy, and that we need integrated approaches to bring about systems level transitions in this rapidly changing world today. So in today's webinar, we're going to be exploring the opportunity for regenerative agriculture in our towns and cities. And we have a fully stacked panel of experts to answer your questions. Um, so I'll introduce them briefly now. Um, Daniel Sherman is CEO of Biologics. After growing up on a family in a family whose sole business was based in intensive horticulture and studying at Massey, he became focused on plant breeding and was successful in removing all the insecticides and fungicides from, um, from the, uh, the plant breeding program there. He's got an interest in urban farming movement um, about reconnecting food production with the urban population, working with farmers who want no part of agrochemical methods of the past and helping prove the viability of this truly regenerative food system. Sarah Smuts Kennedy is an artist, regenerative farmer and originator of For the Love of Bees, the Urban Farmers Alliance and new educational platform Regenerate Now, which all of our panelists are involved in. Um, she has helped to establish uh, Rongoa Garden in Griffiths Garden, OMG, a profitable 500 square meter teaching farm in Simon Street, compost hubs around Auckland and pollinator plantings in public parks and schools. Uh, Sheldon Levitt is the farm and compost manager at Kai Cycle Urban Farm in Newtown, Wellington. And Kai Cycle is an urban farm community compost project established in 2015, uh, which collects all its compost by bicycles, which is pretty fantastic. Mm -hmm. Sustainable transport for the win. Um, and Sheldon is interested in the way that urban farms and uh, community compost projects integrate and can help reimagine urban ecosystems and community cohesion. And finally, uh, Bailey Perryman is, was the co-founder of Cultivate Christchurch, where he worked with disadvantaged youth to make compost and grow healthy food in inner city Christchurch. Um, he's currently now working on a new composting project, uh, starting a PhD on land remediation and fulfilling a contract with the Christchurch City Council, activating food initiatives within the Otakoro Avon River Corridor, which was formerly known as the Residential Red Zone. So wonderful to have uh, these four um, very knowledgeable and talented speakers on our panel this evening. Um, it looks like we have over 80% of you have voted on the, uh, the poll. So thank you for that. Um, looks like we've got about half the people involved in either agriculture or horticulture and, um, and viticulture. Um, that, that, oh, sorry, that's the area of regeneration that we're most interested in. And then 31% interested in urban, which is fantastic because that is, of course, today's conversation. Um, and over half of us on the call this evening actually are living in a town or city in New Zealand. Um, fantastic. And welcome to the 13% of you who are from outside New Zealand. Um, and looks like people have read at least some of the um, Our Regenerative Future content series, which adds a lot of context to some of the conversations we'll be having this evening. So thank you for um, getting involved in that poll. You'll notice that there is a Q&A box um, at the bottom. You can access that from the bottom bar. Please feel free to put your questions in there for our panelists this evening. Um, we'll be at... Um, putting those questions to them along with some that we've um, that we've prepared and also we'll 
uh, live on Facebook this evening too, if you wanted to share with anybody. Um, and we're recording this call as well, just to let you know. Um, all right, I think without further ado, we're going to crack into some questions for our panelists. Um, I think um, let's start with a, a quite a, a broad um, question. Um, I think people living in a lot of New Zealand cities are quite often disconnected from where their food comes from. So um, I'd love to hear from the panelists and maybe you can introduce yourselves a little bit as part of your answer. Um, what, what do you think are, are some of the implications of this disconnection between, um, between food and our communities? Um, let's start with you, Sarah. Uh, well, actually, I prefer um, Bailey. If, if you would start with that that question, um, <laughs> sure. I, I just think, yeah. <laughs> thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, first of all, kia ora everyone. Thanks for joining, and and thanks for chucking me into this one, Sarah. But I think the 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 short of it is. Uh, it's it's massively disempowering. Um, the result of that disconnection means that we're making poor food choices. Can't distinguish between foods that are good for us and uh, or otherwise. And uh, I think it got, it runs a lot deeper than than that, and actually is reflected in. Uh, <sighs> I think uh, inequities in in the structure of our economy and um, educational outcomes, and I've mentioned health outcomes already. Uh, it all comes back from disconnection from the land, and so I'm I'm uh, third generation now, effectively um, removed from from um, being owning and operating an agricultural operation. And it's been an interesting journey back, starting in an urban context um, and trying to trying to find uh, just a simple connection to, to having hands in the soil. Um, but that was really the start of my journey about 10 years ago, was actually just realizing I wanted to learn to grow food. Um, the earthquakes here in Christchurch around about 2010 when they kicked off 10 years ago. That was a major catalyst too. It woke, woke me up big time as to where is my food coming from and what if supply chains are cut off, what am I going to do? And still now to this day, I don't really feel like I have anything like food security. So it's an ongoing, ongoing battle. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I think food security is certainly a very pertinent discussion at the moment with uh, disruptions to much of our supply chains as well. Um, Sheldon, I'd love to go across to you, if you can speak to any implications you see with our disconnection. Um, kia ora everyone, um, I'm Sheldon. Uh, I think I would agree heavily with a lot of Bailey's thoughts. And um, I think the thing I would add is, is um, that that shock to the system that Christchurch um, had during the earthquakes, Wellington is very susceptible to similar shocks um, with, with a single supply chain in. Um, and I think COVID in Wellington has germinated a lot of people into wanting to grow, but um, people just don't know how. They, they don't have um, the skills that, that our ancestors would have held um, for a very long time, <clears throat> which is leading to this disempowerment um, for everyone, whether whether they have food available or not. Um, and I, I think health for me um, is is definitely the the long term thing that that we're going to see dropping off. Um, yeah. Thanks, Sheldon. Um, Daniel, what do you think are the implications between that that disconnection between our food and mm -hmm. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel Sherman. Um, I think it, I mean, it's basically the crux of it is what we talk about, the urban-rural divide. Um, and so uh, where you have not really a great understanding and that of how food is produced, that leads to a mistrust in the urban population 
of the food and where it comes from and how it's produced. Some of it obviously, um, you know, is, in, is grounded in, in some truth, but there's also a lot of um, misinformation in regards to, um, you know, the, the food production and impacts of it for argument's sake. Um, obviously a, a big part of that is, is driven through fear of food security or that, that fear has been, um, I guess, propelling um, the, the interest in urban agriculture um, of late. Um, but yeah, the, the, that disconnect is, is a major reason why we often have these discussions about the urban-rural divide and um, you know, not actually understanding what goes on in, in the food production um, side of you know, the rural, uh, rural economy, for argument's sake. Absolutely. Um, yes, I, I, that's why I, I love hearing about your initiatives, getting people going in the cities, um, given that they, are, they don't have access to those rural environments. Uh, Sarah, anything to add? Yeah, so I think that sort of brings us to speak about why we've actually created or, or supporting the um, flourishing of an urban um, growing sector is that for that has multiple purposes. Um, what initially had us um, really uh, see that as, as really important to create an urban farm in Auckland, for example, was really to demonstrate to people that it is actually possible to grow at scale in ways that are beneficial to the environment. And we had the project for the love of bees, so we wanted to show you could grow at scale commercially um, in ways that were safe for bees. So it has um, so being able to demonstrate uh, that these systems actually work that um, you know, regenerative agriculture is a really viable way of growing. For a lot of people, and, and most of um, New Zealanders do live in cities, um, they need to be able to see that. They actually need to spend time around them, uh, learn the systems themselves, get comfortable with this. This isn't a, a pipe dream. This is a very real proposition, and it is being done. Um, so that's one reason. So that is potentially also, you know, with all of the uh, a big chunk of the population in cities, we do need to grow new farmers. So, you know, we see that our urban farms as being a space where we can actually grow a new generation of farmers that will actually um, potentially move out into the, the countryside. Um, so uh, capacity building. But over COVID, we're, um, you know, we started our projects a year ago with a primary driver for, our, for us collectively was around climate change mitigation um, and really looking at uh, regenerative horticulture, I suppose, um, is really a very credible way to fast track climate change mitigation and repairing ecosystems. But very quickly, it's turned to food security issues, as well as waste recovery, which is a, another massive climate change mitigation um, problem being solved in these urban farms where you know, organic waste is being turned into fertility in local ecosystems. But the food security one was really massive and um, our urban farms continue to supply families over that lockdown period, in fact, even in lockdown level four. So, um, and obviously at the moment, our country is looking at um, food security big time coming down the wire um, in October. It's expected to really kind of peak, um, but also local jobs. So we see these urban projects as being teaching models, data collection centers, research centers, but also spaces that are actually very actively and very quickly within months able to attend to local food security while generating local jobs. Um, on our 500 square meter site in Simon Street, we are now paying one farmer um, almost $1,000 a week um, to farm and we're looking at taking on another person. So, you know, this is real job creation um, and at the same time, generating climate change mitigation outcomes too. Mm, fantastic to see those sorts of integrated solutions. Um, Sarah, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the, the development of the Urban Farmers Alliance and, and what was the impetus behind, um, behind that, that consolidation or, or connection? Well, primarily capacity building. So, I mean, it's, it's all very well for us to have a will to um, create urban farms, but it's a highly skilled sector. So what we wanted to do was to create um, a strategy for like-minded um, early adopter 
projects around the country to actually be able to um, fast track getting to the KPIs that we um, are all really committed to. But not only that, we really wanted to consolidate um, what, our, what those KPIs were. Um, and so we started, I guess, um, Bailey, Daniel and I started um, doing conversations here in Auckland around the possibilities and the potential of urban agriculture. We were invited to go to Wellington where we met um, Kai Cycle. Within um, months, we were actually meeting and formalizing a concept called the Urban Farmers Alliance, which is essentially a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring platform, which is managed over uh, WhatsApp. It gives people a chance to ask a question and have that question answered at the level that they require it um, within 10 minutes, uh, sometimes a couple of hours. Um, and Daniel over sort of oversees it, but however, um, foundation members are now really contributing to each other's learning. We're now supporting over 110 growers and composters around New Zealand through that platform. But the idea really is capacity building. How do we as quickly as possible become highly skilled practitioners de delivering the KPIs that we're really interested in delivering? Fantastic, thank you. Um, I'd love to get into the nitty gritty of, um, of the urban agriculture very soon. And just to remind everybody, you can uh, put questions in that Q&A box for the panel. Um, but first, I'd love to just go to horticulture a little bit more generally. Um, Daniel, a lot of the conversation that we've been having around urban agriculture, both within this series and, and in general, seems to be quite focused on pastoral uh, farming here in New Zealand. Um, can you speak a little bit to the effects of, um, of intensive agriculture on our soils in New Zealand? And what is the nature of, of regeneration of those kinds of systems? Okay, um, so uh, I'm assuming you're talking about intensive horticulture, I guess, rather than yes. horticulture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a, obviously you know, a huge amount of talk um, in around, as you say, around pastoral systems um, and, and, and a lot of sort of toing and froing about you know, how positive or negative those are. There are obviously um, two sides um, that are arguing, arguing that case at the moment, but um, yeah, my experience of having done soil analysis right across New Zealand for many years, and particularly um, one of the key things we measure for argument's sake is soil carbon, which is obviously a big um, uh, part of that conversation about regenerative ag, um, is that quite often pastoral systems actually have reasonably good carbon levels for argument's sake. So you often don't come across carbon in soils, just to give you some sort of idea of, of less than sort of six or seven percent. There are a few exceptions to that around the country, but that generally the pastoral will be over um, seven, eight, nine, ten percent of total carbon in the soil. When you start measuring intensive horticultural um, producers in, in conventional terms, we very often find um, levels below um, three percent. Um, and three percent for people that don't know is basically zero because carbon you don't find soil without any carbon in it um, but what you do find at three percent the carbon cycle no longer functions so essentially at that level what we're dealing with at that point is what I consider a, a pretty much a dead soil a soil that has no real biological activity, no nutrient cycling really able to happen because it simply doesn't have enough actual soluble carbon in the soil for that process to function. Um, and this is, this is the thing, I guess, that many people don't seem to understand or have conversations about, but those are our most degraded soils in New Zealand, um, typically are found under those really intensive a vegetable production would be, I guess, if you wanted to put it in a box because you don't find that fragment sack so much in kiwi fruit or orcharding or long term, but where you get really frequent heavy um, cultivation tilling of the soil, um, we find um, that soils that have been were remarkably con or considered you know very important soils in the country, often we find incredibly degraded. Um, so, you know, very, very low levels without looking at toxicities or anything else like that, just looking at some of the basic soil health indicators, you know, forget finding worms, um, you know, wouldn't even bother trying to count in most cases um, when you, you've got nothing there, that there's nothing there to feed them. Um, and, and these are the soils that we throw huge amounts of fertilizer on to actually grow a crop because there's nothing there to grow the crop. So, um, and, and what you find as a consequence is that, is that you have 
in it where a lot of nitrogen is required often to grow these um, you know, heavily uh, leafy and green crops. Um, and, but as soon as it rains, there's nothing to hold that soluble nitrogen in the soil. So they have to, in many cases, that, that single heavy rain event will destroy a crop. Um, from the point of view of the nitrogen's gone, they can't get on the field to put any more on because the field has no soil structure to it. It's just, you know, it, you drive a tractor on it, you destroy anything that there's, there's nothing really to destroy, but the tractor will disappear into the field because there's nothing to support it. Um, so, you know, you, that's the extreme end of what we're talking about, but there are literally thousands of hectares in New Zealand under intensive um, horticultural production that are our most degraded soils and what we, we were once considered our best soils. Thank you. And my understanding is that the regeneration process is significantly longer for these kinds of horticultural soils than, than turning around, say, a sheep and beef farm? Well, in many cases, the sheep and beef farm kind of has to modify their behaviours or improve with the knowledge that we're understanding how we can improve the process, but they're not starting from a really low point. So yes, in terms of how far you've got to go, um, time is not necessarily such a huge issue. There are ways of, um, I guess, uh, because we're not talking in many cases like sheep and beef, we can be talking, you know, I've got some customers in excess of, um, you know, 1,200 hectares, 20,000 acres in some of those stations. Obviously you're very limited as to what you can do on that scale, but we've got a large scale vegetable producer, you know, there might still be 700 hectares but they've got other tools available to them to address that quickly. But they're certainly starting, and I use that carbon analogy as a difference of starting at 3%, which essentially is zero, versus someone starting at 7, 8, 9%. Um, very, very big difference. Got it, got it, okay, thank you. Um, Sheldon, I'd love to put to you a question that's come through the, the box here from Alex McCall. Um, how important is the role of soil in urban agriculture? Um, Strike, strikes me as pretty important. <laughs> yeah, I guess, um, I guess it, it, yeah, I mean, if you're gonna grow plants in the ground, soil is um, number one, um, not dirt, but soil. Um, but I guess it, it brings up this, this idea that we grow um, our food soilessly in hydroponic or aeroponic or uh, aquaponic systems, which would use um, a lot of infrastructure to do but we, we have the soil available. We've got huge amounts of, of, um, of so-called waste in our cities. Um, humans love to seem to still create that, but we can harness it very easily and build soil if we need it. Um, but cities do also have lots of soil available. I think um, in terms of the, of the regenerative side, it's making sure that we treat the soils um, properly with a, with a good eye. Um, and usually someone's standing behind you like Daniel um, to watch what you're doing. Um, and then and then keeping it alive and running and, and um, you're away laughing really. Um, I, I don't personally have a lot of um, comment on the, on the non-soil growing. I, I've only ever grown in soil. Right. Yeah, seems no shortage of, of compost scraps that we could use. Um, and there is a question here from John McLean about um, asking about the role of the urban compost bin and making uh, green waste into beneficial enrichment from urban garden. So is, is there a role for, you know, just, you know, someone who's got a, um, a standard old compost bin in their backyard? Sheldon. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess urban agriculture also includes um, potentially connected backyard systems or um, different mosaics um, than, than what we're talking about, about um, at scale urban farming. Um, but I guess one, one slight downside of thousands and thousands of, of little compost bins is um, it's maybe not quite as efficient as bringing it together at a street level or a, or a suburb level and producing really high quality living compost that um, can be used right then there to create quite a large garden, but all composting in the city is, is going to have a benefit to the soil around it. Mm. Yeah, and perhaps there's a, there's a role there that, that technology might be able to play in the future in terms of connecting people that are, that are composting near each other. Um, 
Bailey, I'd love to come to you um, with a question actually now um, from Lucy Mary Mulholland. Um, and I know you've, you've got a background with Cultivate Christchurch in, in working with disadvantaged youth. So how do you see a, a need for social regeneration to be interwoven with this ecological um, regeneration? And how do you integrate these two streams? Uh, it's a really good question. And first and foremost, I, I just don't see them as separate. So, um, in an urban context, uh, the um, the work of the urban farmer is fundamentally social, you, even from the standpoint of if you were just having your own operation in your backyard or, or a networked um, collection of backyard sites, you would have to be dealing with other people, whether it's your neighbours, your own family, or um, the people who own the other bits of land and, and give you access. So fundamentally, relationships are involved. They need to be given time. And um, there's a lot of communication and education that comes through in those ways. But um, the, that's sort of the soft end of the, of the spectrum at, at the very, um, at the much harder edge of, I guess, um, social issues or the, uh, you know, where, where society is, is dysfunctional um, is where uh, you find the more structured work um, and the more purposeful in, um, initiatives which are very much designed basically to collide <laughs> people who have um, are experiencing all kinds of basically symptoms or side effects of, of disconnection from land, disconnection from nature. You're basically just trying to collide them with some kind of um, some kind of experience of the power of those the life forces that um, that are running through through nature and, and the the moment yeah it's, it's it's remarkable how fast that can happen though how um, and the, the most vivid experiences for me personally at, at Cultivator with um, working with uh, teenagers, some of whom had been in the, say, the care and protection services since um, since from being a newborn. Uh, they're, they're fundamentally disconnected. Um, and... Uh, there's some instances when with the case within a couple of weeks, you would see somebody going from complete shut off with maybe a hood drawn over and then something starts to trigger and you just start to see this person lift up, hood comes off and that, and the, the world is literally opening up in front of your eyes. So it's, it's tough to get any of that spark to happen, but it's really rewarding when you start to see it unfold. And it's literally like a blossoming happening in front of your eyes. I would also say that um, what we're noticing at OMG, um, which is our, our farm in Simon Street, is just like we have a, um, a full-time farmer, but we have at least 70 to 100 volunteer hours a, a week that happen on that site. And I say, you know, Kai Cycle has similar experience. So we're um, the public are able to use those sites for their own you know, for, for multiple reasons, but a very um, common one is mental health. And we we'll, we'll, in in Simon Street, we have a, a young a young man, Levi, who was our farmer. So obviously, um, whoever is farming changes the quality of that um, the farm. But we have a lot of um, men uh, in their thirties and forties who are using that site um, as an in-between space. They wouldn't necessarily go to counselling, but they, they like the highly skilled nature of the work. They like it's the, the extreme productivity of it, but they actually will come every day for um, a month and then suddenly disappear. They go back into life. But these, these urban farming projects do serve multiple functions. And they, and I think the sort of social cohesion, the kind of, uh, the natural ability of um, nature to heal people um, is a very uh, well used, um, you know, it's, it's one of the major uses of these sites in inner cities. Yes, fantastic to hear of, of those sorts of 
integrated solutions. Um, Sheldon, I, I know you're, uh, you're integrating uh, sustainable transport into your, um, your model. Can you tell us a little bit about that decision uh, for KaiCycle? Um, yes, yeah, so, so KaiCycle uses um, bikes to collect uh, um, 50 tons of, um, of green waste. Um, bikes with trailers, right? Or <laughs> yeah, and they're electric. Um, Wellington <laughs> will be an interesting pedal powered um, Indeed. hilly mission. I guess the decision to do that really came from Wellington's not great for cars already. Um, it's not really designed um, in the best way. And so adding, trying to get around in a vehicle would have been a nightmare, stopping and starting. And, but also looking at, you know, if you're going to integrate something into your model, um, what are the other effects of doing that? Um, just like various um, activities on, on the field could be detrimental in the future. Um, the activities that we do off the field are also need to be um, taken into account. And um, it also gets other people thinking when you, when people start to see you biking around collecting food waste, they wonder what else could we do using this method of transport? And, and is there a, is there other ways to move stuff um, short distances in our cities? Um, which is encouraging to see about two or three more businesses um, start in the city, purely based around bike, bike transport systems. Well, that's fantastic to hear that you're having, having uh, that kind of community effect. Um, I'd love to uh, go to a question now in the chat um, from Edgar Henson. And um, this is a, a question that's aimed at Sarah, but I think it would be great to hear um, from other panelists what's happening around the country. But um, Edgar says uh, Auckland Council has a lot of available land, but only two community gardens. Uh, where's the what's the opportunity there? Um, well, there's massive opportunity. There are actually more community gardens. I'd say Auckland actually has a lot of community gardens, but one of the things that we, we're really talking about is quite distinct from community gardens into urban farms. And what we say is gardens grow plants and farms grow food. So what we're talking about is, um, and all of the farms that we are um, helping emerge uh, around, are using the CSA model, which is a community supported agriculture. So looking at, so for example, um, 500 square meters we know can produce 40 CSA boxes a week that's feeding and each box should feed four people so that you know you can extrapolate out how many um, how many people can be fed from a certain size we're looking at the moment to try and um, get farms in Auckland and in fact around New Zealand and Wellington as well between two and a half thousand square meters five thousand square meters where you're suddenly looking at 400 CSA boxes a week and then you're starting to look at being able to employ um, 10 to 15 people you are generating um, a really good revenue so these projects need seed funding um, and then actually they become self-sustainable within a year to 18 months. Um, so you know, there's a lot of um, land in, in all of our cities actually and our vision is to have an urban farm every one kilometre. That's what it's going to take for us to actually get the critical mass, to get the KPIs that we're interested in. Um, and so there are resource manage. you know, there's, there's a whole lot of bylaws that need to be um, uh, changed to make it be able to um, potentially uh, sell from uh, council owned land. But there are also land, there's churches, there's, there's, there's a lot of land. Land isn't the issue. It's actually having a vision and imagination for the transformation of what that land can do. And um, the seed funding to enable those projects to actually start and be successful in the, in the period that they need to be to actually support people. Um, we at the moment have been looking at Albert Park for a 5,000 square metre farm. That looks like it might be too tricky, but at the moment we're looking at Fraser Park, which is in Parnell. But already with the Waitamata local board, um, they have been really thrilled with um, OMG uh, and its capacity to become um, a self-sustainable business that's meeting all of those KPIs. And there's a real will to, um, and I know Wellington Council similarly, are really excited about the capacity of um, these urban farms to you know, attend to food security, climate change mitigation, waste recovery. But um, there are some, there are some um, 
changes that have to be made. And these things do need to be seed funded. And we're really hoping that uh, government um, see the Urban Farmers Alliance strategy. Uh, we have the recovery farm package that we, we put out um, at the you know, lockdown level four, which um, really I think is a very credible way for um, you know, fast tracking um, ecosystem restoration, uh, food security that isn't um, food banks, but actually long-term food security, but actually also generating quite substantial jobs. Yeah, you've got everything in there by the sounds of it. You've got waste recovery, employment, mm. climate change mitigation, uh, mental health. Um, mm. and, and on mental health, um, we had a really great um, community and mental health conversation much earlier in the series with um, John O'Fru and Sam Lang. I think there was yeah. Yeah, episode four, if anybody wants to check out the recording, a really rich conversation around, around how getting involved in the land can be very beneficial to mental health. I'd love to come back to that question of, um, of uh, finances and barriers in a moment, but I just want to give um, Sheldon and Bailey um, the opportunity to speak to whether, um, what sort of opportunities they see in, in Wellington and Christchurch. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, so my my current role uh, on part time contract with Christchurch City Council. Some may or may not be aware that um, uh, as a result of the earthquakes, there was 400 hectares of housing cleared alongside the Avon River, which stretches from the centre of Christchurch City out to the eastern suburbs and um, for reaching the ocean. And that land is deemed uninhabitable for housing, but is essentially a river corridor that is speaking very clearly that it needs to be recovered. So my role is to look at the areas within that total land area, which are more suited to productive land uses, everything from community gardens through to, um, there have been independent um, independent reports looking at different agribusiness options for that land as well. And um, horticulture is definitely coming out on top there. So there, there's the potential there for a continuous productive urban landscape. Um, and of course, even before that, before we made a mess of it as an urban settlement, it was um, used as a, a food basket and harvested from by Mana Whenua, um, mm. my father in particular. And so there's a, f a fantastic array of um, land uses that are gonna open up there that'll be not just for those who live immediately by the area um, still, um, but for the rest of the city. And of course, as an exemplar to, to the world really, what's possible um, for the use of this kind of space within an urban within an urban area. Mm, okay, thank you. Um, Sheldon, what opportunities do you see in Wellington? Um, I think um, there's, there's a similar um, potential of, of a large rollout of urban food. I think Wellington, um, one thing it lacks is lots of um, flat land. Um, <laughs> so I think some big potential there is, is um, really honing in and, and getting some good skills on on um, hill-based um, farming that that is as productive as as the flatland. There's a lot of um, of hilly land that is that is around, and I think as well, not far from from the edges of the city limits is quite large quantities of intensive market gardens. And so, um, how can the the urban farms connect in with those? With, mm -hmm relatively close regional farms. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll leave uh, my other comments for the, for the barriers question. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, Daniel, I'd love to ask you a little bit. There's a question here from um, Katrina Wolf. Um, it'd be great to hear if there are businesses and corporates backing urban farming projects or if it's dependent on the sort of funding used by community gardens. So I wonder if you could speak briefly just to the the, the financials of urban regenerative agriculture? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, the, there are businesses, um, uh, certainly 
participating um, within the urban farming um, sector. So there are um, businesses like Carbon Cycle, for argument's sake, um, which are uh, large supporters, um, uh, otherwise previously known, known as the New Zealand Box um, composting um, system. Um, but, um, you know, it's obviously there are those type of companies involved and there's a, there's a range of them. Um, I mean, including ourselves, but um, yeah, it's largely being funded through, you know, our local government um, uh, support, really. Sarah can probably speak much better to, to that experience um, along with the others than, than I can. Um, well, uh... Sorry, um, but to answer the other side of that question is looking at the economics, um, I guess, around you know, how do these urban farming projects sort of stand up? And that's an area that I um, do have a lot of involvement in because of trying to get um, for these farms to be standalone. So once, although the funding might have come from various different sources, actually thinking another company was Fenton Billboards, of course, that gave a lot of support, um, has given a lot of support in the past to um, like the OMG project there in Auckland and the Flood of Bees. But um, to look at the economics, I want to look at it from a business, purely business point of view as to how do these businesses remain sustainable. So the model that they would require continuous funding for argument's sake from, from, from um, communities, um, uh, associations and, and local councils, to me was kind of flawed because there's obviously we've had the perfect example lately with COVID-19 that the vast majority of the funding that was going to be available to some of these projects has just literally evaporated overnight. So it really highlighted the fact that we had to build business, we had to basically have a business model that was sound um, and it was based around, uh, in my experience with horticulture, it's, it's all about productivity. Many people do focus on, you know, like maximizing the, the price that they sell a product for, but in actual fact, success in, in horticulture and agriculture systems, in my experience um, is pretty um, broad with that around the world as well, as it's actually all about productivity. Um, and so we had to make these systems incredibly productive um, because they don't have massive area. So generally what you find is the larger the scale of the agricultural um, uh, businesses, the less efficient they are per square metre. So as you bring these things down to 500 square metres, obviously you haven't got any room to waste. You haven't got time to waste. You have to have that thing producing at incredible levels. And to put it in real dollar terms is what we try and get people to help to understand is that um, you know, if you're looking at, um, and I won't talk about pastoral systems because they're on a, on a very different scale, but on other horticultural systems, the best you can probably hope to that I see in turnover is maybe $300,000 a year at best for say gold kiwi fruit. And there'll be some growers out there that find that hard to believe that they actually, someone's achieving that because the average is, is well, it's probably less than 200. Um, but that's kind of the best, you know, avocado, we, we know how expensive that fruit is, but at best they're doing $100,000 a hectare um, from an avocado orchard and, and most are much, much lower than that. We're looking at, say, the OMG model for argument's sake at the moment, it's modelling around, if you extrapolate it per metre out to a hectare, so we're comparing apples with apples, you're talking about $1.3 million um, per hectare. And we have projects in the system that we've measured I think 1.6 was at the upper end of that per hectare. Um, you know, so what we're talking about is incredible productivity can be achieved. And you have to remember that in the vast majority here, we're talking about without fertilizer, the nutrition support is basically through composting and through understanding the soil bio biology system. And this is the essence of regenerative agriculture is actually working with the soil system and understanding that soil biology. Mm, those are some, those are some uh, very compelling figures in terms of productivity. Um, do you think that's uh, scalable on a, large, on a large scale? The business model, and, it, and it's hard sometimes to get your head around it when, like myself, you come from a very conventional business in terms of how you measure profitability and success. And, and although in real terms we're talking about profitability, um, you know, the actual... Um, sustainability of this is being able to pay the farmer. Um, uh, we're looking at a minimum of $25 an hour. We're looking at that sort of being based on a 40 hour week. 
and we're looking at what that farmer can produce within that space. And so that might be 50% of the total um, turnover is going towards labor. But in actual fact, when you look at it that way, is, is, is because the, the larger the scale gets, so when we get up to 5,000 square meters for argument's sake, we have a bit more automation coming into it. Um, you know, so there is a bit more in there, but the, we're talking at about a model at the moment that is, is quite labor intensive, but that is kind of how the urban, that's how those, the, the people in that environment actually connect with the soil. You know, they have no love of, of they're not going to get in it. You're not talking about the scale we're getting in a GPS guided tractor and the person actually never sets foot in the field. Um, you know, and covers hundreds of hectares. So that's a, in, in per square, again, as we're talking about per square meter, we're talking about very low returns. Um, and to give people an idea, because people think of, you know, I think one of the questions before talked about, you know, how much, I guess, thinking how much land is actually available. Well, you've got 4,000 parks in Auckland alone. In the 25 regional parks, Auckland has 42,000 hectares. Um, you know, this is all within the community land. So we're not all talking about turning all of that into food production by any major stretch of the imagination. But like Sarah says, land is not the issue here. It's how we're utilizing, um, how we're farming and how we're utilizing and how we're managing that soil. It's, it's all at a much more basic um, level. But the, the opportunity is about, um, so the, the keys to supporting these projects is that CSA, that community supported agriculture model where somebody wants food, um, you know, from a local source, because like the OMG, our target is basically everybody that would hopefully buy, get their food from OMG from these CSA boxes could arguably walk there and pick it up. You know, we're not, we don't want to put it on a courier and ship it, you know, across the city or anything like that. That's, that's not the model that we're talking about. This is very much localized food production. But as, you know, we keep pointing out here is that this, this, it, it makes an awful lot of people much more passionate about their food and interested about how their food grows. And you can see as we go through this process um, that we can scale we can scale it up. But the fact is uh, the more people involved in it, the more that are likely actually to get. And we do have people in that um, model now that are talking to us, you know, that are more larger scale market gardens, so 10, 12 hectares or, you know, or larger. Um, sort of following along uh, these no-till regenerative practices. Got it. Thank you. Um, let's come to that question of, of barriers. Um, Sheldon, what do you what do you see as some of the the big barriers to um, scalability or or to your work in general? And and what are the roles that perhaps local authorities, um, councils, or or others can can play to help remove those barriers? Um, one one barrier is possibly this this issue of imagination when we look at at these green squares dotted over our cities, um, and then archaic hangovers of of legislation. Um, those people are long gone, but um, there's there's lots of bylaws, um, both at the at the council level and at the state level that that never thought in, in a wildest dream we might want to grow food in the city. And so we now have to go back and um, look at, at some of this legislation and um, allow it to, to have um, some of these things done on it, um, particularly the Reserves Act um, is one that, yeah, in one interpretation, you could easily farm as long as you don't have any goats, um, but in, in other interp interpretations, um, it's quite narrow, um, purely because urban farming wasn't around in the 70s. Um, but I, I guess in Wellington in particular, um, I was in a meeting today and, and um, there's a draft um, report due to be submitted to the council soon that, that recommends a lot of these things, that recommends that a work stream is developed in Wellington to, to basically understand what land is available, who owns it, what what state is it and um and create a mandate to a community um food council to begin um allowing some of that policy work to be undertaken so i think wellington is potentially really beginning to push ahead and and see the potential here but the biggest barriers at the moment for us is policy and and bylaw got it um i'd love to come back to goats in a minute but um 
Sarah, I'm curious to hear if you've noticed any, any difference um, with a slightly different council structure than we see in most of the country with a consolidated uh, super council as such. Has that, um, has that mean it meant any changes in terms of um, the, the way that you have to work with um, local authorities? Oh, you're on mute. Um, yeah. I just say it's just super complicated, <laughs> um, being a super city. Um, what, what we're finding post-COVID is that there's a really massive conversation happening in all areas of Auckland City around um, the opportunity for urban farming to, to um, you know, attend to food security as a primary thing. Um, a lot of Marakai um, projects, and, but they're all at that kind of conceptual stage. And what's really missing is an integrated um, policy or plan for enabling these things to happen. Um, last year, you know, we were all involved in um, a climate change action plan, just discussions about you know what could happen in our city to make us climate change ready. Uh, there's just been so much talking done and so little action. Really, the action that's been taken are by our communities um, and they're massively under-resourced. So while people are talking about these things, um, communities like ours are just, um, you know, there's burnout. There is a, a frustration that, you know, we can't get funding from MPI. We can't get, you know, the Ministry of, um, of Environment has actually been really supportive, but, I would say, you know, Auckland Council is in a really bad place financially right now. Uh, and there's never been more need for these projects to be, you know, actioned. We have in South Auckland, there really is a food desert out there. And, and, there's, and there's a serious, serious issue around access to nutrient-dense food. Um, but also we have a massive issue around um, waste recovery and in Auckland we have been um, looking and investing in a biodigester to take our organic waste um, and ship it down country and turn it into, um, into heat essentially and we just see that that is uh, a massive waste of resources that actually the very same um, organic waste could easily, this, you know, a, a better investment is to keep it in the environment where it has been created and to turn it into opportunity and climate change mitigation opportunity but also um you know uh jobs i mean jobs are the next big thing we need to be thinking about one of the things i think it would be a super shame not to mention um before, at, by the time we had ended this is just how um how amazing these farms are at in terms of um, carbon capture drawdown and while there is a lot of conversation at the moment around you know sequestering carbon in soils what um, is really possible to measure is the above ground biomass that is actually you know is captured carbon and um, you know the and that's measured by productivity and these the systems that we are encouraging people to take up in the urban farming have massive productivity and massive above ground biomass which really um daniel i wonder if you might um just share some of the data around that because i think in terms of getting your imaginations triggered and feeling really inspired about the opportunity for regenerative urban agriculture to make a big difference in regards to our drawdown requirements, um, I, that's what has me be in this project, are those opportunities. Daniel, could you speak to that? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, the, you know, there's a huge amount of, I guess, conversation around this whole um, carbon sequestration, um, and, and that's, you know, particularly where we hear that coming through from the pastoral side of things and, and, and how effective um, these um, regenerative systems can be and actually increasing the amount of carbon. But often, yes, we are only talking about, more often than not, measuring the carbon in the soil. Um, but one of the systems, uh, and the name just escapes from the top of my head at the moment, but essentially when you start embracing this sort of, um, this whole process and you create these 
um, healthy soils that have this um, you know, healthy carbon cycle, nutrient cycle process happening in the soil is you create that massive abundance above the soil. And the vast majority of the carbon in, in the world is actually held in plant material actually above the soil. Um, that's where our biggest carbon um, store is, the, the, the soil follows that. But, um, you know, the, the sort of examples that are talked about, and I'm just trying to think of the research that came out of New Mexico University, their regenerative agricultural um, uh, sort of research facility there. I mean, they're talking about as much as 19 tonnes of carbon per hectare per year in a fully activated um, biological um, system. So, you know, when you've really got this regenerative process happening, versus what's happening in our conventional systems, um, often you're talking that is five or six times, um, the, these regenerative systems can be five or six times higher than what we're currently achieving in our conventional agricultural um, approach um, to it. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of science being, uh, a lot of study being around there and there's some people really leading cutting edge of that, but it shows the true potential of creating a food system which is incredible incredibly carbon positive, rather than having these conversations about how negative our food system is to the carbon. And um, we can argue one way or the other uh, in many times, but in these sorts of systems, it's so overwhelmingly carbon positive from, from the amount of carbon being captured, not only in the ground, but above ground, that there is little argument to be, to be had. Yeah, it sounds like there's quite the opportunity for a reframe there, and, and, and if we change our processes a little. Um, I uh, was going to ask about the involvement of animals. I know we've only got a couple of minutes left though. So um, if anyone wants to weave that into their last 30 second thoughts, that would be great. But I would love to give you all the opportunity to just um, yeah, say anything that, that's still on your mind. Uh, Bailey, you, you had your hand raised there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's uh, interesting. We've we've touched on some of the bylaws and policy and plan and, and constraints, but it's the the river corridor I've mentioned a couple of times. There's a whole regeneration plan, and that has then um, created overlays in our planning framework. And there's a rule within that that animals grazing is allowed in that area up until the first of July two thousand twenty four. And I can't get a clear answer from any of the planners yet about why that date. I'm imagining that it's something to do with the overall vision for the space is ecological restoration and they see animals in there as being counterproductive to that. So they've time limited where the animals can be used in that space. The, the, la the area is large enough for us to dream of and implement uh, some kind of rotational system where we have stock um, closely cared for and probably brought back into shelter in the evenings by a caretaker in residence who's looking at a continuous area of around 40, sometimes maybe even 50 or 60 hectares. The most efficient way to manage that landscape would be to involve animals and the most efficient way to achieve regeneration of the land and soils to that area would be to involve animals as well. So I, I would love to see, um, I would love to see integration of, of animals and I'm starting to do some work with uh, staff at Lincoln University about that. So yeah, mm. it's got a huge role to play. Fantastic. Um, Sarah, instead of um, giving you your 30 seconds, I'd love to put to you a quick question that's come from Annabelle Langbein. Um, can you advise, I know you mentioned there around food desertification and there was a question around that earlier, um, uh, the viability of providing low cost produce to low income households in free food banks or schools. Oh, you're on mute again. We'll just have to unmute you. Yep. Uh, it's, it's absolutely huge. I mean, the thing about th these farms are so productive that you can actually produce enough food to actually sell enough to pay all your wages and have plenty to give away. Um, and that's, that's one, of the, um, one of the things that we've been doing modeling around. We already give two CSA boxes of our 40 away to um, uh, a group called Afina Mai, who we've been working with in the, who, who are uh, Maori with lived experience of homelessness. 
Um, but also that community gets to be um, kind of, we're really looking at the moment as what does urban farming mean um, in relation to, um, you know, uh, a Māori, um, you know, and um, Marakai, um, Maramataka. So, you know, in terms of what I would say about the urban farming movement and why we're here is that it's extremely joyful. It's incredibly optimistic. Um, we feel like we um, are really making a difference and we can see that happening. And I think being able to make this available, Common Unity are a classic example in, um, in Wellington who are, you know, really are feeding their community by growing locally. Um, but the opportunity is, I see that we need to take this out of being in a voluntary sector into being a new economic sector. So we're really looking at systems that can enable you to actually have a business and feed your local community. And if that includes giving some of it away, then it, if you're that productive, that's a possibility. Fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. I love, I love that, making it a, a, a real economic um, industry. Mm. Um, we rapidly run, run out of time a little bit over here. So, Sheldon, 30 seconds, any final thoughts from you? Um, maybe just, uh, just adding on um, <clears throat> briefly to, um, to Annabelle's thoughts. Um, I, yeah, I fully agree with Sarah that um, a lot of these farms are already social enterprises Kai Cycle's been um, providing huge amounts of food for the last five years um, to an organization called Pie Bosch. Um, but I think as well, looking at, um, at things like living food banks, um, there's many cities around the world that they, the food bank doesn't buy food, it employs a farmer. Um, yeah. one, one example of that would be the Ottawa um, Food Bank. Um, and then schools, um, you know, rather than, shipping in food, we could just have a garden on the school field um, and easily integrate children into, into that um, from, from a really early age. Um, so I think this is all possible um, and this is definitely an underlying thread in a lot of the conversations um, in this movement. Thanks, Sheldon. Daniel, any final thoughts? Um, yeah, a lot, but I should <laughs> summarise it in the 30 seconds. The, um, yeah, I mean, the key when you're starting to talk about, when I started the conversation about productivity uh, being the underlying sort of driver to being the sustainable, what, what drives the sustainability and success of these projects, you know, there are projects out there where already the goal is they're giving away more than 50% of the food. So they're only actually basically having to recover their costs. Once they recover the costs um, by selling whatever percentage of food they need to do that, whatever else they produce is simply given away or sold at a very low cost into needy communities. That's a very strong part of, um, you know, of some of the projects that we're looking at here. And in my, uh, when I'm working with um, projects and trying to help to develop their business models, we try and produce a, uh, a model where they're able to give away 25%, or in some cases, we're talking about a model where we've got give your CSA. So somebody might buy two boxes, and, and one gets donated. So the farmer isn't necessarily, you know, is compensated for his cost of producing the food, but the food's still being given away to somebody or families that need it. So it's, it's you know, this, this is all about a, a change to our food system and it is very much driven by the social um, need. And the whole idea that we can grow, you know, I get a real problem with the organic and regenerative production that it just wants to be focused about how they can get more money for their food. When I already look at, well, food it, for many people is already too damn expensive. If you want to make more money and be more successful as a farmer, learn how to actually be more productive um, and not focus on some sort of, um, you know, marketing influence that can mean you can charge you know, two or three times more for your food because it's regeneratively grown. Regenerative mm. is, is the key. Being regenerative is the key to actually achieving that productivity. Mm, very good point. Um, all about healthy food, healthy people, thriving communities, healthy environment. But love also, it. can I say one last thing? Is mm. that actually a lot of those communities in need actually would love to be able to learn to grow. And so this is why we've created the Regenerate Now uh, platform, is that you know anyone who wants to participate 
in this urban farming sector, I believe, should have access to the knowledge that they need. And so we've been trying to, um, that's part of the Urban Farmers Alliance, but it's also part of the Regenerate Now, is that actually this is highly skilled, um, highly skilled work, but it's work that can be learned in, in months. Mm. Wonderful. Hey, thank you so much to all our panelists this evening and thank you for sticking with us. I know we've gone a few minutes over this evening. Um, it's been fantastic to have everybody along with us this evening. Um, so please do join us next week. We've got um, a conversation around regenerative tourism with Trent Yeo from, um, from down in, Christ, in Queenstown, rather, um, Eco Trek Zip Tours. Um, Dr. Suzanne Beckin from over in Australia, um, sustainable tourism professor, and uh, Larissa Cooney from Bay of Plenty um, Tourism. That'll be a really interesting conversation given the, uh, the situation our tourism industry finds itself in. And then finally, we've got our, um, our series finale for the Our Generative Future um, series. And it's um, a, an episode where we'll be drawing everything together around forestry, tourism, agriculture, horticulture, and exploring the topic of how we can move toward a regenerative economy for New Zealand, and particularly for New Zealand's primary sector. Um, we'll have um, Rod Oram, Dame and Salmond, Mike Taitoko and Hamish Bielski on that call, which are all panellists we've already had in this series. So it'll be really um, drawing together um, a lot of big picture thinkers. That will be a 90 minute special episode. Um, so we'll be able to dive a little bit deeper into, into that one. Please do join us for the next couple. Keep an eye on the Pure Advantage and Edmund Hillary Fellowship um, Facebook, Instagram pages for all the details, or you can go to pureadvantage.org or ehf.org for details. Thank you so much again for joining us. It's been wonderful to have you. And thank you to all our panelists once more. Ka kite. <laughs>